As we approach the halfway point in the skill guide series, let's move into the class that sadly and unjustly receives the least love, and that is the Barbarian, a class often attributed with tankiness, survivability, and, well, being forgotten for pretty much everything else. The sad reality is, the Barbarian does not really encompass these traits as much as you think, since outside of raw life and resist, the Barbarian lacks a lot in terms of durability, and on the flip side, he is still easily one of the best single target farming characters in the entire game. So today, let's dive into his arsenal of tools for killing that will eventually lead us to the full precision tool that is the Barbarian. First up, let's look at the truly unique aspects of the Barbarian, the dual wielding skills, with Double Swing, Double Throw, and Frenzy being the main active skills with this, with the Masteries we'll cover in another episode being the butter to this bread. Starting with the most changed skill on the list, we have Double Throw, though most of the change we see here is in the Mastery. The skill itself actually got a fairly decent damage bump with 2.4, which does help out its offensive nature quite nicely. This combined with the new ammo effects we mentioned from the Mastery takes us from a more meme build that requires specific equipment to a build that is actually endgame viable in many situations and is powerful enough to justify making for personal enjoyment. The way the double throw functions is pretty straightforward. It quickly alternates the throws on each hand at a much faster rate than normally throwing because it functions on a similar system to double swing. And while the mana cost is minimal, one mana per throw, so two mana per use of this skill, the ammo cost was always the big limiting factor to it. So with 2.4, you're able to not only do decent damage, but not have to worry about becoming the machine gun barbarian of your dreams. The one little thing to remember while using this though is that while throwing knives and axes are faster, they are shorter range than javelins, so that may impact your choice of weaponry, but I find the range to be a minimal issue personally. As far as how masteries affect the damage of these items, we'll be covering that in the mastery video coming very soon. Now, as we move to the skills that have had much more appreciation in previous versions, we start with Double Swing, which, as you guessed, operates pretty similar to Double Throw, but instead of focusing on one target, Double Swing will attempt to swing once at two different targets, only focusing on a single target if there's only one available. Double Swing also has the perk that it has a decreasing cost per level, becoming free to use at level 9, so there's no reason to avoid keeping it on swap. This is especially true since Double Swing has a slightly different animation timing than its big brother Frenzy, allowing it to often reach faster attack speeds with normal gear. Though obviously it still gets a boost from the Frenzy speed up effect, so the general practice for normal enemies is to charge up your Frenzy, then use Double Swing to deal faster attacks for a few attacks, then quickly swap back to Frenzy to keep the charge up, operating pretty similar to the Druid's Feral Rage and Maul attacks, where you're keeping that charge running to augment your main attack. Speaking of Frenzy though, it does have some fairly unique traits, such as the synergy with Berserk providing a conversion of physical damage to magical damage up to 20% with 20 points in Berserk allowing you to do 80% physical, 20% magical, which makes it a really straightforward use on physical immunes mixed with normal enemies to keep that leech up. And this conversion, much like Magic Arrow and such, happens after enhanced damage and criticals are calculated, but before resistances are checked. Frenzy also has a nice perk of being less likely to be interrupted than other attacks, since it functions similar to Zeal in its interruption rules. The last nice perk of it is that Frenzy effect, shown by the swirling around your character, provides the attack and movement speed bonuses to all attacks while it's going. Though it is worth remembering, it is a charge up skill just like the druid counterparts we mentioned, so at level 20 it takes 20 hits to reach the maximum charge, and then just one every now and then to maintain it. Beyond that, Frenzy operates pretty similarly to Double Swing, just a bit slower, with it trying to strike two targets if possible and costing mana cost per attack, not per use of the skill. That said, as far as raw DPS, you will want to look at calculators to see which one you want to use out of the two, due to Frenzy's enhanced damage effect and Double Swing's naturally faster attack, though most people will end up using both at some point in the run with dual wielding barbarians. So, do you enjoy the dual wielding barbarians or are you more of a sword and board or even a two handed bruiser? Mention it down below and as always keep gaming, have fun and peace out. This has been Alzrath. Bye. While the combat tree is mostly oriented towards strictly offensive moves, there are two skills that actually serve a fairly interesting alternative use that are forgotten about, namely Leap and Leap Attack, one being a movement tech combined with control for team play, the other being a movement tech combined with both local and area of effect damage as of 2.4, and both actually got a fairly nice improvement with their travel speed with the release of that 2.4 patch. 
Starting with the more forgotten of the two, we have the base leap, a skill often looked at as just being a necessary precursor to the other skills and rarely used, and as such, most players don't realize that it has utility beyond simply leaping over obstacles or through bars, but it actually also has a knockback effect that can be used in a number of situations, especially in team games, for staggering enemies and repositioning them mainly. And as your points in this skill grow, you'll notice the radius of this effect grows as well, even to a point of allowing you to knock back enemies who are off screen with a skill level in the mid 30s or higher. Now, unfortunately, it does not do any damage with this, but it can be used to shove enemies into corners or to cluster them together for use in combination with various air of effect skills from other players, or even just to speed through an area and avoid encounters. The major drawback of this strategy, though, is sadly the limited range on leap. At least at low levels, it makes it a little frustrating at first. Though, with even a half dozen levels in it, you'll already be up to half of its maximum travel distance due to diminishing returns on the leap distance itself. So the only reason to go further is that knockback back effect radius, which is a steady two-thirds of a yard per level. Now, the more popular leap skill, Leap Attack, got a plethora of buffs in 2.4, and is much more popular for solo play due to it being tied to an attack, but still being able to target just the ground as a movement tech, much like Charge. And as part of its nature of not having to worry about maximum ranges, it makes it kind of useful, so even a one-point investment, it can reach as far as you want to click, unlike its little brother. In addition to these original functions, 2.4 provided the increased travel speed that we mentioned earlier, making it easier to hit with, and also increased the damage and attack rating boost of the skill, and introduced an area of effect on the landing that is pretty much just a miniature war cry, with the same radius, just somewhat lower damage, making it a pretty solid option, at least in normal and nightmare, though you will find the area of effect a bit lacking in late nightmare and into hell unless it's really high level, but it's still essentially free damage since they only increase the mana cost of leap attack by a tiny amount. Now, as far as some of the things both these skills have in common, you have weird hit registration while airborne, since you're sort of Schrodinger's barbarian while using these skills and whirlwind, in that the rules as to what can hit you get a bit wobbly. But basically, you can be swung at in melee, hit by tick-based auras, but you'll jump over missiles, though you can be hit by melee-fired missiles while airborne. And while leaping, your defense and blocking are still fully functional, though, so you can avoid these just by being, well, tanky. The other fiddly bits are that you have various lockouts while airborne, such as not triggering cast when struck effects, as well as being locked out of weapon swaps and potions to prevent odd behaviors. Though I do actually hate that potions are locked out, since you can still be hit while doing this, much like with Whirlwind. But overall, in spite of these quirks, these high-flying movement techs are still easily the second best in the game, and extremely efficient options for the targeted farming the Barbarian specializes in. So, do you use leap skills, or do you slap enigmas on your barbarians and ignore them, or do you just use the barbarians' enhanced speed to sprint point to point? Mention it down below, and as always, a special thanks to the channel members and patrons for making this content possible, and if you want to be added to the on-screen credits and support the content, you can find links in the description down below. Continuing the combat tree, we have the left hook, right hook, and uppercut skills of Bash, Stun, and Concentrate. Skills that may seem fairly straightforward at first, but hide some weird and interesting mechanics. Some being exploitable, others just being, well, weird. So let's start with the really weird one, Bash. On the screen, you'll see the usual plus percentage damage, plus percent attack rating, and some other odds and ends. This is at first glance a straightforward skill that causes a damage boost and knockback effect, and for most people, that's exactly what they will notice it doing. Though that said, it has an odd little plus flat damage sitting there that behaves, well, odd in a handful of ways. The most egregious one being that it actually does not increase the damage, and that would be just the usual lying character screen type deal if it didn't actually have something else weird about it. Namely, the plus damage is applied between dealing damage and determining leech, so with the 30 damage you see here, we can actually leech a tiny minuscule amount of life or mana from even physical immunes like the wraith you see on screen now, while doing zero damage. It really is strange and maybe something that gets patched in the future, but is one reason why the damage formula videos can get real fiddly and why most of these guides skip this specific skill. Moving on to the less weird and more straightforward, we have Stun, which does exactly what it says on the tin. Stuns the target while also dealing damage and giving attack rating as most of the skills do. Some important things to remember about this though are that stun length is hard capped at 10 seconds and due to some rounding, the calculation for its synergy can get a bit fiddly. 
though the only time this skill is really useful is when you're still on the struggle bus for equipment, since at higher levels you will generally be killing enemies faster with your main skills. Now, while I will include a link to the chart down below in the description, the key levels for Warcry synergy with this, if you're going for a stunner barb at least, or even Warcry barb that maybe uses this on the side, is at level 20 Warcry you need level 26 stun to reach the 10 second cap, which probably the lowest you'd want to aim for is probably level 35 stun and level 15 Warcry to reach the cap, but that's kind of just here and there. With less than that, you'll find that the stun duration will often require an unreasonable 40 plus level stun skill to really hit that locking down duration. That said, even the shorter durations we have here are often more than enough for taking down your normal enemies before they recover, unless you are killing way too slow for the difficulty or your build. The third and sadly most often underestimated skill is Concentrate, which like the other two is focused on giving you that extra damage and attack rating, but it also packs some interesting perks and synergies, the most well known being the plus percent defense, which applies for the duration of the attack animation, meaning you can tank up and hold your own fairly well with this on builds oriented around reaching those high base defense values. As long as you're in the animation, you'll have massive defense values. The other aspect, and one people often ignore, is the Berserk Synergy, which operates much like the Synergy on Frenzy by converting a percent of the physical damage to pure magic damage, maxing out at a 20% conversion, meaning you do 80% physical with this value determined after all the enhanced damage and critical calculations, but before the resistances, so it can be pretty punchy bypassing physical immunes, but still letting you leech should you be using it against a mixed group of enemies that happen to have non-immunes as well. So, do you run any builds centered around stun or concentrate? Do you know the damage quirk on bash? Would you change anything about these skills in 2.5, maybe to integrate this damage a little bit better? Mention it down below, and as always, a special thanks to the patrons and channel members who help keep content like this around. If you'd like to see your name in the credits, check out the links in the description. As two of the more iconic barbarian combat skills in modern Diablo 2, Berserk and Whirlwind have had important roles in the history of the class, with Berserk being the most popular choice among modern magic find and farming builds due to its high damage and pure magic type, and Whirlwind being a former powerhouse build that has slowly encountered the rest of time, but as of 2.4.3 patch, it has been getting some active development at least, for better or worse, so may end up seeing some return to glory in the near future. Starting with Whirlwind, since it got the most recent changes, the actual attack frames have been shifted and flopped about in a way that, much like the druid attack frames, has irritated some people while it seems like a godsend to others. Though the reality is, it's a bit of column A and a bit of column B, since unlike previous versions, your attack speed with Whirlwind is now able to be influenced by off-weapon modifiers, with everything from laying of hand gloves to even effects like fanaticism and decrepify, which does drastically change the equipment concerns for the build, since chill is now something you need to consider. In addition to that, Whirlwind also got a few changes to how it treats the weapons you're wielding. With the addition of the attack selecting targets for both weapons on the first swing of the attack, if you're dual wielding, instead of how it previously only checked the main weapon for the first attack and then switched to checking for both weapons after. And there's also a change to some weapon choice limitations, though for 2.4.3 you will be able to get most one-handed weapons to a 4 frame per attack speed with gear and such, while you're going to be limited to 5 frame per attack with two handers. Now, outside of the attack speed breakpoints, the rest of the changes in Whirlwind in 2.4.3 are generally positive ones, with more attack rating at all levels, and more damage at, well, normal levels at least, though it does actually do less damage than the old version, starting at about level 28. Though this is of course thrown off a bit by changes to the attack speeds on the skill, and of course the improved attack rating means you'll probably hit more. As far as the raw mechanics, Whirlwind has more in common with Leap and Leap Attack than necessarily the other ground-based skills, since while spinning, you cannot swap weapons or skills, you can't use potions, and you cannot be interrupted while actively spitting. There is also the fact that Whirlwind cannot trigger chance to cast skills, and that is still an issue, though we'll see if that ever changes. Though the major difference between Whirlwind and the Leap skills is that movement speed is a factor in your actual travel speed while spinning. Though on the plus side, you can still block and such while moving with this, so even though you can get attacked like normal, you still have your full defensive ability active. Now if you die while spinning, or if your weapon breaks, these effects do not resolve until that use of the skill ends. So you'll still do damage while traveling, and you'll still finish out the movement before succumbing to your wounds or having the weapon shatter in your hand. There are still a few bugs for off-class or soft point only whirlwind, but chances of running into them are slim to none, and if you hit them, a save and exit will fix it. 
Probably the last mechanical note for Whirlwind is that if you are using two weapons, the speeds are averaged, but when it performs the attack check, it will attempt to find two targets in range, similarly to how Double Swing does it, but if there's only one target, both weapons will hit that one target. Thankfully, in the other corner of this episode, we actually have a much simpler skill, Berserk, which while it also got changes in 2.4, it wasn't nearly as extreme simply swapping the Shout Synergy to a Battle Order Synergy, so it will be much easier and more common to max out the skill and its synergies. Since most Berserk-focused builds want both Howl and Battle Orders maxed, and Shout never really made any sense, since the defense penalty is applied after the plus percent boost, with only defense you have while you're under its effect being defense versus functions, things like defense versus missiles. And while the duration of this defense penalty reduces with time, chances are in combat you're not going to really notice it. You'll be staying at zero defense, since even at level 60, the penalty lasts for a whole second, in which time you'll likely have made at least two attacks even with slower weapons. Though this penalty is not that big of a deal, especially since it's usually used with Howl to limit the number of enemies you deal with to the actual bosses and uniques that cannot be chased away by Howl. The actual big penalty is that by converting your attack to pure magic, you lose all ability to leech, and while Berserk can crit and benefits from enhanced damage effects, these are all applied prior to the conversion, so there's no way to sneak any physical or leech damage in there. So do you run a Whirlwind or Berserk barb, or do you prefer the slightly less popular but still powerful Frenzy or Concentrate barbs? Mention it down below, and as always, a special thanks to the channel members, patrons, and yes, even the handful of you that have purchased games off of Humble Bundle, since it really does help keep this content coming. Barbarian Masteries are odd. On one hand, they are great for improving damage for a specific weapon type, and pretty much guaranteed grabs for any melee Barbarian and even throwing Barbarians. Though, on the other hand, they do restrict your weapon flexibility with the character unless you burn a respec. Though, that said, they do hold their own little piles of secrets, quirks, and useful improvements that many new and even moderately experienced players may not know about. Starting out, there are six Masteries. Blade Mastery, which boosts your abilities with daggers as well as both one and two-handed swords. That importantly allows it to apply to melee attacks with throwing daggers in Resurrected, which is something that was not available in Lord of Destruction or Classic because, well, they didn't include daggers there. Axe Mastery, which boosts your abilities with one-handed, two-handed, and throwing axes, though it does, like Blade Mastery, only apply when you are chopping at them in melee. Mace Mastery, which boosts your abilities with both one- and two-handed blunt weapons, which not just includes maces, hammers, and clubs, but also wands, scepters, and staves as well, with one of the most popular crossovers being Ribcracker. Polearm Mastery, which is sadly the least interesting of the batch, only applying to swinging polearms like halberds, scythes, etc., and nothing else. Throwing Mastery, which only applies whenever you use an explicit throwing ability on knives, axes, and javelins, but got some pretty drastic changes in 2.4 with the ability to preserve ammo as well as pierce with throwing weapons, at least, not to mention critical strikes replenishing quantity as well. And finally, Spear Mastery, which applies to spears and javelins, though again, like Blade and Axe Mastery, only only when the weapons are used with melee skills, so no, you cannot double dip with Throwing Mastery. And with the exception of Throwing Mastery, they all apply about the same with increased attack rating, damage, and critical strike. Though it is worth noting that it is a special critical strike that is considered separate from equipment critical strike and deadly strike, so it is not directly stacked on them. So if you have, say, 30% critical strike from mastery and 70% from equipment, you still will not have 100% critical strike chance, but rather a separate 30% and 70% chance because they're separate. And as always, if one triggers, the rest are ignored, though mastery, like other critical strikes, cannot bypass critical strike restrictions on skills like sacrifice, which just flat out cannot crit. Now, Throwing Mastery is especially quirky, both due to the replenishing quantity, pierce, and ammo preservation aspects placed on it in 2.4, but it also has an oddly ignored quirk due to being more of a gimmick skill prior to the patch, and that is a bug present in Lord of Destruction that sneakily doubled the Mastery's damage boost on single throws. So you'd actually do more damage per throw chucking a single javelin with a shield than without, though obviously each throw would be much slower than whenever you're using double throw, just due 
due to the raw mechanics of it, so it is just a fun little trade-off for durability. As far as mastery strategy, you usually want to choose just one and go with it, though with throwing mastery there is some room for dual masteries if you go point light setups like whirlwind and double throw or unbuffed berserk, though these are the exceptions not the rule and most players will favor spending most of their points on war cries and synergies rather than a second mastery since as said earlier, you cannot double dip. It's just one applies exclusively to throwing, the rest only apply to melee. So what's your favorite mastery type in the Barbarian? Do any of them seem to be less loved or less useful than others? Mention it down below and when we do get back to doing the build guides, expect at least one of each mastery for the sake of fun. And of course, a special thanks to the channel members and patrons for their continued support. Similar to the Masteries, the remaining passives of the Barbarian are fairly straightforward, and in spite of their individual quirks, they aren't quite enough to push their uses beyond being 1.1 wonders with plus skills. This is mostly because of how the math of the skills work out in relation to their various improvements. Probably the least loved of the four is increased stamina. This is because, for the most part, it doesn't add much to the character, but with its new synergy with Frenzy, it at least has some uses that can be beneficial if you're looking at making a speedy barbarian. As with things that provide a percent boost to life and mana, increased stamina only provides a boost based on base stamina, flat stamina, and stamina from hard points and stats. It won't boost stamina from, say, plus stamina per level sources or from plus vitality on gear. Though outside of certain situations, you generally won't be running out of stamina on a barbarian even without worrying about this at higher levels. After that though, we have a skill that probably is a bit more confusing to people, and that is increased speed. This combines diminishing returns, meaning you'll get most of its benefits from even just basic plus skills, since it caps at a 50% boost, but it hits 40% at only level 15, and 25% at a mere level 4. So putting extra points in it is generally not going to be worth it unless you're looking to outrun arrows. The reason why this skill is a bit fiddly is because of how fast her run walk works, since speed is a sum of all mod modifiers possible, which is a pretty long list of different caps and functionality, and a 25% boost from the skill is different from a 25% boost from equipment, even on just a raw speed value. This is because equipment's faster run walk has its own diminishing return formula, which results in 25% bonuses there only being an effective 21% basic speed increase. Moving over to the right, you have two skills that sometimes get more points, but that you won't find many reasons to actually invest in during the late game outside of very specific use cases. Starting with Iron Skin, we have the Defense Boost. This provides a steadily increasing amount of percent defense boost. This stacks the same stages as Ability Defense, like Concentrate, Defiance, Shout, etc., and is additive to them. So it can still provide a relatively decent boost, but generally speaking, defense only goes so far when playing, especially if you're playing a character that needs to close ground. Generally, I would only consider this on leap builds or whirlwind builds that don't really need to worry about that movement defense penalty like other builds. And even then, there's much more efficient ways to boost defense, especially since Shout has better synergy pairings and provides more defense for the same amount of points. The last one is actually probably the most important of the passive skills to get at least one point in, and that is Natural Resistance, and with an okay amount of plus skills, you can get a fairly reasonable bump to all your listed resists. This does make the skill rather special since it boosts Poison Resist in addition to Lightning, Fire, and Cold, but as with the other skills on this list, diminishing returns are still a thing, so you won't want to dump too many points into this just enough to get those plus skills working for you but it is one reason why the Barbarian can get away with a lot more than other characters on super budget equipment. Overall, I think this tree is probably one of the best avenues for providing some unique flair to the Barbarian that never got fully explored, and I would love to see more flavor given not only to these four skills, but also the weapon masteries we covered previously since it could really differentiate the sub-builds for the class. So what changes would you make to the Barbarian Masteries tree, or do you think they're fine the way they are? Mention them down below, and as always, keep gaming, have fun, and peace out. This has been Alzerath. Bye. In Diablo 2, one of the most favored Magic Vine builds is the Berserker Barbarian, often called the Pit Zerker or Pindle Zerker due to where and what it farms, though it is far from being restricted to just those areas. The reason these hyper-focused single-target hunters are so successful is not only due to their crowd control with Howl and massive, nearly unresisted damage from Berserk, but also because of a unique Barbarian skill that greatly increases the amount of drop chances you have. Find Item.
Though before we dive into that specific skill, we should talk about its precursor and synergy, Find Potion, which provides, as the name implies, the ability to pull potions out of corpses. Though it follows a corpse rule similar to what Grim Ward does, in that not every type of corpse can be searched by this skill. And despite being a war cry, it is a melee-only skill, meaning to hork the corpse, you need to be next to the target. Though thankfully you don't need to select it, just be using the skill in the general area. All that said, generally you will not find this skill used very often simply because all it does is provide potions, with a 60% chance of healing, 30% chance of mana, and a 10% chance of giving you a rejuvenation potion, with the different quality tiers depending on how far along you are in the game, with full rejuvenation potions being the only ones that can drop in all three difficulties. But for heavy horkers, you might consider maxing find item for its synergies with both Grim Ward, providing extra physical resist reduction, as well as the 1% increase per level available on our next skill, find item. Now, as mentioned earlier, Find Item is the main skill that Berserkers use, and it uses its percent chance to force a target corpse to roll another drop, which for basic enemies is nice enough and can get you a decent supply of item bases, but it's not super important there. But when you start farming uniques, champions, or things like the Council and Travancle, or special item droppers like Pindleskin, then this value skyrockets, at least in terms of finding more uniques, sets, and rares. Now, as far as how it works mechanically, it basically forces the target to roll a drop from its tables, and in the same patterns as it would if it died normally. In addition to this, it uses your magic find values at the moment of horking, so you can have a higher magic find setup for after you clear out the enemies than what you used to kill them in the first place. This all means with Pindle, you can get four drops per run instead of two, and you'll get twice the pile of potions. Against the council, you'll get extra attempts at their amazing drop pools, and against uniques in level 85 areas, you'll get more level 88 drops from them. Now, Find Item, while not as restrictive as Find Potion and Grim Ward in terms of their targets, still do have limitations. For example, you cannot use it on things like Act Bosses since they have unusable corpses, period, for anything. You also cannot use it on Shattered or Already Used Corpses, so if a Paladin is using Redemption, or a Necromancer is using Corpse Explosion, or a Druid has Dire Wolves, you have less targets to pull items out of. Though the flip side is also true, since if you use your find item on a corpse, none of these characters, or enemies for that matter, can use the corpses either. So that means less corpse explosions from Neelithak, less reviving defiled warriors like Pindleskin's minions, and less shamans reviving stuff every five seconds. Now, is it the best farmer in the game? It kind of depends on what you're hunting, but it is exceptionally powerful and can get you everything from extra stacks of gold to extra unique, rare, and set drops to round out your Holy Grail collection, even some decent bases if you know where to farm. So, do you enjoy running Berserker Barbs and yelling at dead things, or do you prefer just to sweep through without needing to do a second pass on the corpses? Mention it down below, and as always, a special thanks to the patrons, channel members, and supporters that make this content possible. Among the most well-known Barbarian skills are the three central war cries, Battle Command, Battle Orders, and Shout, which comprise the glow you will see under nearly every Barbarian's feet in public games. That said, there are a few things to keep in mind, at least when it comes to the behavior of these skills. Starting with the most basic of the bunch, but also the highest level requirement, Battle Command almost always is a one-point wonder since the only improvement is duration, and it's usually only used as part of a pre-buff. But it is one that you will almost always grab because it provides plus one to all skills for characters affected by it. There are some builds that can use higher levels of it, but for the most part, even they will prefer more points elsewhere first, and I'm not really a fan of dumping more than one point in it even for those builds. But if you do use it at higher levels for higher duration, remember that it does apply this plus skill to itself as well, so recasting it a second time will give you a slightly longer duration. Though, as a last cast wins type skill, where even lower level casts can knock out others, you'll want to be aware of any other barbarians in the party casting it, since they may override it with a much lower level version. Moving up the tree, we have probably the most desired of the three skills, Battle Orders. This is because it boosts life, mana, and stamina by an ever-increasing percent, and you will want to cast it after using Battle Command just to ensure you get the longest duration as well as the largest boost. And it can be slightly annoying to have this in a multi-barbarian party since it's a last cast win skill as well, meaning lower level battle orders can easily override the highest level ones, so you will want to communicate with the other barbarians to see who has the best level of it. 
As far as the weird mechanics of it, you will want to understand that it functions like other percent stat increases, where for all of its boosts, the percent is only applied to base and flat values. So for life, it only gives bonuses based on your base life, hard points and vitality, and flat life items. It will not give bonuses based on life per level or gear based plus vitality. The same goes for stamina as well as mana, albeit energy instead of vitality values. So in many cases, that's why you'll see someone favoring a piece of equipment with plus 50 50 life rather than a piece of equipment with plus life per level that might be in the 70 or higher range at the level they're at since only the former will actually get boosted by this skill. Now, while those first two can be found on Called Arms, so you'll see it on other characters as well, our last one cannot, and that is Shout, a percent defense boost that the Barbarian uses to get their defense values up to reasonable levels when needed, and is one of the stronger defense boosts in the game, though like all defensive perks, become absolutely useless while your character is running. And like the last two Warcries, this is a last cast wins ability as well, so higher level Shouts being overridden by lower level Shouts are perfectly normal. And as far as how it works with other defense boosts, just like other percent boosts like Iron Skin, Defiance, and Concentrate even, the percents are added together. So if you have a 100% boost from one and 200% from another, you'll end up with 300% boost to your base defense, so it will never get extremely out of hand as far as the perks go. Shout also has the distinction of being the only war cry cast by an enemy as well, so keep an eye out for whenever you're facing the Ancients, and if you're having trouble hitting, you can wait for Maddox's cast to expire. The last thing to remember about Warcries is that Warcries are missiles, much like Shockwave. So if you're buffing up the team, make sure everyone is in an open, clear area. That way they are not blocked from the buff by being behind a pillar or a corner, and the closer they are, the more likely they will be hit since there are dead zones for the missiles as you get further out from the character. And next time, we'll actually take a dive into the more offensive Warcries, but for now, if you're curious about the utility Warcries, check out the link on screen now, and as always, keep gaming, have fun, and peace out. This has been Alzheimer's. Bye. Today we take a look at the last of the Barbarian skills, the Offensive War Cries, a list that contains an interesting mix of skills. One that has interesting mechanics but is fairly limited, one that is insanely powerful but almost always forgotten, and one that is treated like a meme skill but holds some pretty strong utility. Starting with the limited one, we have Taunt, which, despite having interesting mechanics, doesn't quite have the utility it seems like it should at first glance. Basically, this skill is supposed to reduce the potency of enemies by lowering their attack damage and attack rating, and forcing them to move into melee range to attack the Barbarian, which, as a tank, sounds awesome. But for the most part, it's a little bit more limited than one would hope due to being a single target skill, meaning to deal with packs, you have to stand there yelling for a decent number of seconds. That said, it does have its utility, especially in team games, or even for preserving your mercenary in desperate moments, or in a pinch keeping enemies like flayers from running away, or bringing ranged units into melee range. And since it has a fairly long duration, once you do have things taunted, they will usually die long before it expires. As far as reductions in enemy stats, there is no hard cap on the values from the skill, but there is a minimum value on damage of 10%, so you can never reduce a monster's attack damage to zero, but you can get it fairly low. And generally getting the attack rating reduction over 100% is kind of pointless as well, but even with that said, most people treat this as a one point wonder if they use it since the duration and lure effect do not change, so you don't really need to worry about those fringe cases in most builds. The other forgotten skill is Battle Cry. This skill is another curse-like offensive war cry, but instead of dragging in enemies one by one, while debuffing them of course, Battle Cry focuses on the enemies that are already around you, as evidenced by its very limited range, but still packing a powerful effect of reducing their attack damage and defense instead. Even to the point of reducing most enemy defenses to zero above level 26 unless they have some sort of percent defense boost helping them. This skill is one reason why the Barbarian is one of the few martial characters that doesn't really benefit nearly as much from packing the Infinity Rune Word, and in turn Conviction, to increase their hit chance on enemies, since in the heat of battle he can just pop a mid-level or high-level battle cry and get much the same effect, while also reducing the enemy attack damage fairly significantly. And while this is shorter duration than Taunt, by a significant amount amount, the ability to impact an entire crowd makes this utility in actual fights so much more for any melee barbarian or heck, any melee character that can pull off a quick swap to call to arms. The third skill is the only one of these that does not borrow the curse effect, but it also does not need to, and that is Warcry, the infamous stun and damage Warcry that is 
awesome outside of the fact that it costs way too much mana, even as of 2.4. That said, there are builds that focus on using this semi-effectively, though due to its lower damage, this will only go so far, and you will need some fairly heavy mana recovery to get its full potency out. But a more effective use of it is actually as a support skill. This is because Warcry has a few interesting effects on it outside of damage, since by causing a stun, you can force enemies to stall around you while your mercenary handles them, or while you quick swap to other attacks to take them out, since even a stun length of just 2 or 3 seconds is enough time to swap to a big hit and slam several of them on a single target. And one nice thing about Warcry is that it can even stun physical immune, so it's great with Berserk, since this effect is not tied to dealing damage, but rather just bypassing a block check. Though it does still suffer from stun's biggest weakness of only having a 10% chance to stun any uniques or champions, but beyond that, it's pretty solid. So do you bother with the offensive Warcrys, or do you prefer sticking with the more simplistic brute force methods normally attributed to the Barbarians? Mention it down below, and as always, keep gaming, have fun, and peace out. This has been Alzerath. Bye. In Diablo 2, fear effects can be interesting, and they were made even more so by changes in 2.4, specifically to Grim Ward. So today we're going to look at all the sources of fear and how they fit into the AI override stack that we covered in the Necromancer curse videos. And these will all override other standard curses when used, which is one big reason why they're only used in very specific builds like Pit Zerkers and for unplugging narrow passageways for summoners. Now, much like Dim Vision, fear effects are fairly easy to override themselves, but unlike other curses, fear effects have a hierarchy for which one will always win against the lower ones rather than going for something like highest level or longer duration. So it is possible to override a long duration fear effect with the lower duration one if you just happen to get the wrong stack. Now, the way fear works is when it's applied to the enemy, it tells their AI to run away at the next AI check. So enemies may keep running towards you for a moment, but as soon as they they trigger that AI check, they will begin running away from the player. It is worth noting that, as with other AI curses, enemy AI can be broken by these skills, resulting in them going into an idle mode rather than fleeing, though it is hard to reproduce reliably. All fear effects function this way, usually using a duration rule for how long something will try to run. Starting out with the lowest flea effect on the totem, we have Howl, that despite being able to be overridden by all the other fear effects, is actually a rather unique skill in a few respects. First, it delivers the fear effect using projectiles, just like all Warcry applications function, so enemies can thread between the missiles and be unaffected by it, but generally speaking, if the radius is still within the normal screen space, you will not see this very often. The other odd aspect is that it is the only fear effect that has a level formula. Simply put, unlike Terror and Grim Ward, whenever you hit an enemy with Howl, the game checks the monster's level against your level plus the skill level plus one. And if the monster level is higher, it will not be hit by fear. If it is lower, it will be. After Howl, we have the combat ability called Hit Causes Monster to Flee. This can override Howl's effect, and is sometimes one of the ways you end up with shorter duration fears after longer duration Howls. Now, as far as the mechanics of this, it basically triggers a percent chance to apply the fear curse effect on them. And while the percents listed are not always super accurate, the margin of error on them is usually about 1% at most, so it's not going to make a big difference for the intended use. It is also an interesting note that if your attack triggers blind target and monster flee from equipment, the monster flee effect will override the blind effect, though when it comes to chance to cast effects, those are a little bit different due to trigger orders. Back to the skills though, we have Terror, the Necromancer Curse, which overrides both of the previous fear effects but also has god-awful radius. And while most other skills update their tooltips to reflect their durations in Nightmare and Hell, Terror forgets to. So remember that Nightmare halves the duration and Hell quarters it, so you're going to get a lot less time with this than you might think in Hell, but at least it doesn't require a level check like Howl. And despite being just the same as the rest of the fear effects, having one level in this as Necro can be pretty useful for crowd manipulation while you're trying to navigate as a summoner or to give you a little bit of breathing room if you're not in a location that's good for corralling with Bone Wall or Bone Prison as a Bone Mancer. So while I prefer Confuse in most situations, it can be a handy one-point wonder for specific situations. And lastly, we have Grim Ward, a fairly significant change skill in 2.4. It is an AoE terror effect, though the enemies will run from you, not the totem, so keep that in mind. And while the duration of the fear effect is short, it will continually reapply it as long as the enemy is in range of the totem. 
As far as how it works mechanically, it can only be summoned from what is known as a soft corpse, so one with a proper amount of flesh and bones. So it can be summoned from a zombie, but not a wraith or a skeleton or even a thorned hulk, for example, since they don't have enough flesh and bone. And it will summon a different cosmetic totem depending on the size of the opponent. Now, if this was an older version of the game, this is where it would stop. But instead, this skill got two buffs in 2.4. Namely, it now slows enemies affected by fear, as well as reducing their physical damage resistance. Now, it's important to note this effect is tied to the curse it causes, not just being near the totem. So as you can probably guess, it will not deliver these effects on anything except normal and minion monsters, which means you will not get the slow or the damage boost against uniques, champions, or even bosses that happen to have minions near them to summon it from. So that does limit its use, but it is a lot of fun to throw on a barbarian or as part of a group with something like a multi-shot Amazon. So do you use any of the fear effects for your builds, or do you avoid them so you don't have to track enemies down? Discuss it below, and as always, a special thanks to channel members, patrons, and Twitch subs that make this content possible.